And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have a returning good brother to the temple, cra creator, uh, creator of such such things as he as Hellas, one of the one of the fl one of the big flag bearers of the D6 system through Mythic D6, and br and now bringing back Godsend Agenda for a new for a newfangled edition. The one and only he is not one of the fly he is not one of the flying Graysons, but he is Jerry D Grayson. How you That's doing right. today, I was, man? I was I'm doing pretty good. I was one of the Graysons that got away uh, <laughs> that fateful night, and uh, I never called Dick back. You know, he was like, oh, my family's dead. I'm like, mm, I'm still here, but we're good. <laughs> and uh, we yeah, just it, kept pushing. Yeah, it's, it's, been a, it's been about two years. How, how have you been holding up? Uh, pretty good mm -hmm. through the uh, the copocalypse. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I've got my, um, what is it, my football helmet, my leather jacket with the spikes on it, my baseball bat. I've got my, uh, you know, my uh, gasoline uh, chugger ready, and we're out on the wasteland just riding around uh, uh, pillaging and whatnot at um you know swap meets or comic shops things like that that's i think that's the, that's the, the worst yeah, thing. that's the extent of my apocalyptic uh rating would be uh swap meets comic shops and you know the occasional dairy queen what's i'm uh <laughs> i'm low end what's what's next you're what's next you're gonna go to a you're gonna go to convention cosplaying as joggy from hokuto no ken you know what's funny about that is right before this hit before the copocalypse hit, I was putting together my cosplay outfit for the next comic convention I was going to. Mm -hmm. And it was going to be epic. It was going to be like a little chubby Luke Cage. <laughs> and uh, it, 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 you know, the next, you know, no more conventions. Mm -hmm. So, you oh. know, everything that was on that list um, on Amazon, because I was like, okay, got my shoes, got my uh, pants, got my chain belt, mm -hmm. my uh, tiara, uh, and then wonk wonk, and I was like, "Well, all right, I guess no more chubby uh, Luke Cage." Um, guess we'll just be troglodyte chair. Yeah. <laughs> I um, up, up, apparently I'm in the minority when I when I when I, uh, when I joked and I said I said this someone as a joke that what a what a live action Luke Cage should should have been taking templates from is the Sam Jackson shaft <laughs> from the Sam, not the original. We're we're not doing uh. Uh, the original shaft no, uh, that it's, was fantastic as, temp as tempting as that was i i'm always a, i'm always a sucker for the idea of of a of a legacy character right and oh like, so this would have been shaft 2.0 this would or luke cage 2 like his uh his son or something yeah so, something Baby luke uh something like that um right like i said like i said i'm I have I have a soft spot for the for that concept of the generational hero, um, right? The big the big two of the big examples of 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 that kind of thing, of course, would be Robin and the Flash, right? Um, then ag then again, I had also said that the Mar that the um, Marvel anime exper experiment in the in the mid two thousands was uh, was a bit, a bit of a letdown because they played it too straight. Right. Like, oh, when they had the uh, the the Kid Avengers or whatever it was, or no, it's when the, it's when they hired Anime Studio Madhouse to do, to do a bunch to do a handful of anime based on uh, Marvel characters, and instead instead of instead of applying anime techniques to those characters, they just pl they just played it straight like you were just reading a story from the comics. Uh, and as as weird as the Marvel manga verse idea was in two thousand three, that at least right. was a little more on point. Right. I mean, yeah, I never really watched them because most of the Marvel cartoons, they're not particularly interesting or fun for me to watch. Like I'll try to watch them, and I'm like, this is. It's yeah, they're they're very middle of the road kind of just. Well, to put the to put things in perspective. I was at Comic Con the year that the year that two of those projects got teased. I've told I've told this story elsewhere. Um, those were for Wolverine and Iron Man. The mm -hmm. Wolverine one 
very much looked like it came straight out of Kawajiri's work, especially Ninja Scroll. Right. And given that one of the more famous Wolverine stories is the Japan Saga, it certainly makes sense. The Iron Man one was very much Iron Man, but the the camera techniques were very much akin to the infamous Itano Circus that's seen in Macross or Robotech. Itano yeah, Circus, see now you're losing me. Um anytime you anytime you see the missile spam in in Robotech, that's what ah. that's what it's referring to. It's it's often called the Itano Circus with the, with those with those long shots to try and Basically, tr basically try and mimic some of some of the dog fighting scenes in Top Gun. Right. And I was like, oh, okay, th okay, is that if that's the route we're going, I'm, I'm there for it. But that's that's n that's not what they ended up do. That's not what they ended up doing. And I th I thought that was a wasted opportunity. Um. At the very at the very least ha at the very least do the X Men in the style of a Sentai as a nice little tribute to when Stan to when Stanley collaborated with the um, makers of makers of Super Sentai, right? Yeah, that's how I'd, that's how uh, we got the Japanese Spider Man, which is really fucking weird. It is. Have you ever seen uh, the Indian Superman? I have. I have seen that. I have seen that. I think there was a Brazilian one as well. Both of them yeah, they're, are. <laughs> they're they're pretty crazy, just like the um that one and the Turkish Star Wars. Mm -hmm. Are insane. Yeah. Like you don't know what the hell you're looking at, and then you're you're like, wait a minute, and then you'll see clips because the Turkish one had actual clips of Star Wars in it, mm -hmm. like cut uh, into whatever they made, and it was weird. It was so surreal. It was almost like a fever dream, like uh, you know, like I was sick, laying in bed, dreaming this. But no, it it actually exists, and it was uh, sublimely awesome. If I want, uh, if I wanted a fever it. dream, I could always watch um, Face of a Frog. I've never seen Face of a Frog. See, now I've got uh, stuff to wrinkle my brain. <laughs> well, that stuff. that's that's what we do here in the temple. But the when it now we did the last time I had you on, <clears throat> I think you were still doing early play tests for this new version of God Send Agenda. Right. And we did we did kind of go into the orig origins of it, and and it is funny looking back at where. Where Godsend Agenda was in it in its early days compared to where it compared to where it is um, now, because mm -hmm. the fir my first incar the first incarnation that I was aware of it, it was you it was using West End D 6s system. Yes, that's the <clears throat> second edition. Mm -hmm. I I um I have I've that's the earliest I've been able to find. I have I have not gotten lucky finding a first edition, and I've. I would l I would like to one of these days just as just as a historian, right? Um, well, um, you know, mm -hmm. there's uh, the PDF which is available, mm -hmm. and um, you know, as one of the levels for the uh, pledge for uh, the Kickstarter, mm -hmm. there's a level called the Apocrypha where you just get all the stuff that's come before, mm -hmm. and so you can just see how this thing has um, changed and morphed. Uh, through its different iterations. And, um, you know, the reason for it, you know, one of the big reasons, um, you know, this got an agenda is different from the second edition, which is different from the third edition, is one, um, me as a, you know, so-called game designer, uh, you know, I've evolved. Mm -hmm. So I, you know, I have the tools now, or at least I believe until like, you know, 10 years from now or 20 years when I uh, go, no, now I've got the tools. But I've got the tools now to basically give you what I originally intended. Mm -hmm. um, so kind of think of this one as your uh, George Lucas special edition. So there will be all sorts of stuff in here that will uh, contradict uh, earlier editions. Uh, but just because, you know, my sensibilities have obviously changed, you know, as I've evolved as a human being and, you know, just the gaming technologies that I have now that, you know, I didn't have with me at the beginning. So there's certain things that I wanted to do but didn't have the vocabulary and the technology to do then. And, uh, you know, by technology, I just mean, you know, the game design acumen to do such a thing. Um, but now um, I do. Um, and it's been a long time coming. Yeah. I mean, once this thing is published, it will literally be 20 years from uh, the first edition to this edition. Mm -hmm. 
well, kind of makes. <clears throat> what I do find kind of amusing is that even in that, tw- even within that twenty years, I'm still seeing the DNA of of sorts of West End games. Right. It's just it's just that instead of um, instead of the D6 system, which um, is which might be making might be making an interesting comeback in the co- in the coming months with the um, open D6 project that Star Anvil is spearheading. Right. Um, I end up, I end up being reminded of Masterbook. Mm. Okay. Uh, especially especially with two with two things. One, the fact that you shifted over into a two D ten system, and two, the results chart that's on the character sheet that's not too far removed from the bonus chart that was in um, Masterbook projects like the well core Masterbook. Um, I think there was an Indiana Jones one and. Um, the one that I, the Shadow Zone box set that I still have, right? Uh, and uh, don't forget what was it? The Men in Black as well, and Tank Girl, and uh, <laughs> some of those. Yeah, but... there, was, there was some. There was some weird. There were some really weird choices for, um, for adaptations from West End. There, for fuck's sake, there was one for Species. Yeah, yeah, that movie was great. That movie was a great date movie back in the day, man. <laughs> I, I, I thoroughly enjoyed that movie, mm-hmm. uh, the species. Mm-hmm. Well, two of them, like the third one. I don't think I, uh, either. I've the seen third one doesn't remember. exist, right? But uh, but no, the first two I enjoyed. Mm-hmm. But um, what you might be seeing is uh, the influence of uh, Greg Gordon and all the design, because Greg Gordon I would consider probably one of my Yodas. Mm-hmm. Um, and Greg Gordon uh, did one of uh, my favorite role playing games of all time. Or you know had a hand in it, mm-hmm. um, which was DC Heroes. Um, also, he did uh, the James Bond 007 did design work on that one. Mm-hmm. And that guy, if there's um, a single guy that is you know has influenced me, it's been that guy. Mm-hmm. And you know you see his influence over Torg, you see it you know on Masterbook. Um, mm-hmm. But if you look, if you I'm not sure if you've ever played DC Heroes. I ha- uh, by um, Mayfair yes Kings. and yes and no. I the version the version that I ended up playing was the legally distinct Blood of Heroes. Um, oh yeah, yeah no, not that one. But <laughs> but I that am was... that was the first that was the first experience I had with that. But I have but I have in the intervening years pl- um, played through it. And when um, when people were crying up a storm about about um, what about the about Watchmen getting a getting a getting a um, game adaptation when the film was coming about I'm like where the fuck were you people when the watchman when the watchman module was a thing well most of them probably weren't either alive or they were little kids I mean uh you know <laughs> I remember but you know mm-hmm. I'm also uh middle aged where it's a lot of these people like it's the same thing when you're watching like a YouTube video and someone's uh, got a video explaining Star Wars to you you know and you're like, oh, okay, well, go ahead and explain it to me. I'd but like they're to... explain it, and it's just like, like you know, it's kind of like when like a little kid comes up to you and shows you like a trick they learned at school, mm-hmm. or tells you like you know, uh, you know, a joke that you know we've all like told when we were in school. But you know, it's cute, mm-hmm. and uh, you're like, oh, that's cute. On one hand, you know? I can definitely see that. On the other hand, um, I always I always get a bit of a laugh when. When my favorite whipping boy, the D and D Grognard, um, lament, laments, laments about um, about mo- about more mo- about more modern games taking inspiration from video games, and I'm like, SSI, does that mean anything to you? Right. <laughs> or or fuck that. Even the even the D and D on the Play Doh engine back in the seventies. Right. Tabletop yes, games yeah, and computer that. games have a much closer relationship than people seem to think sometimes. Well, some of the people, well, there's a lot of, like, cross-pollination back and forth, but mm-hmm. I'd probably say, like, um, there's a lot of uh, role-playing DNA and a lot of role-playing or video games. Actually, well, we know there is. There's a ton of it. Um, you know, just because some of the people who designed some of these games went on to do video games and, mm-hmm. you know, back and forth. But, you no, know, like, God's an Agenda, yeah. it's... Uh, it's Yeah, it's got a lot of, like, DC Heroes DNA in mm-hmm. it because uh, that's one of my top three favorite games in the entire world um that one cyberpunk and uh you know cyberpunk 2020 and uh talislanta are probably yeah i 
probably my top three favorite games ever. And if you look at like mm-hmm. God's and Agenda, you will see all those games represented in this game. Yeah. Um, and you know, it's it's a lot sleeker mm-hmm. than uh, the other iterations, and you know, it's a lot more robust too. So it's mm-hmm. it's just um, it's basically me going, okay, I've got a closet full of like stuff that I've been saving up. I'm getting ready to uh, pour this all into a funnel and, you know, distill it down into, you know, what I want God's and agenda to be. Yeah. And it's kind of what I did here. Um, so, yeah, you know, does it have master book influence? Yeah, just because, you know, it's adjacent, you know, because of Greg Gordon mm-hmm. uh, and his designs and stuff, which, you know, he carried with them and I kind of pilfered from. So uh, I'm using some of his toolbox and other people's tools. Yeah. So yes, I guess you probably could see some master book. Mm-hmm. I know I like the cards from them, and I do love cards. Yeah, uh, in role playing games. Um, well, since you mentioned cards and role playing games, just out of curiosity, do you, do you ha- do you have the do you have any of the uh, Saga System books somewhere somewhere in the back? Uh, the Saga System books, yeah, I believe so. Um, somewhere around here, I've got um got the superhero version i've got the dragonlance version i mm-hmm. guess that's the only two versions that's the only two that they did yeah. um tab creations kind of has, kind of has done their own successor with the with saga machine right oh uh, which is which there's like f- there's like five different games he's done with we've done with that system mm. um one of the one of them i covered on the ch- one of them i covered on the channel a while back which was against the dark yogi Right. Oh, I think I got that one in here someplace. Mm-hmm. And <clears throat> most re- most recently, he's finally delved into um, fantasy with Age of Ambition, but he's still he's still putting support for the for the other projects within that umbrella. Um, and speaking speaking of influences, since you since there's a few that you br- that you brought up on the Kickstarter page, I'd like to delve it delve into those and what you dr- and what you drew from them. Um. Mm-hmm. So the first, the first, and I'm, I want to separate the, it into three pillars. The first okay. being the fourth world saga and the Eternals from Jack Kirby. Okay. Um, yeah, there's uh, basically Jack Kirby mm-hmm. is that dude's uh, hand is uh, any modern super hearing that uh, you enjoy, you mm-hmm. can thank Jack Kirby for. Uh, mm-hmm. Even the stuff he didn't touch, he influenced. Oh, um, yeah. That guy, yeah, he is, yeah, that guy is the one. He is literally the king. He is, uh, and his work being so incredibly dynamic and so forward thinking, uh, that's what's amazing about like his work. Like no matter what you look at, even the stuff where like you go, okay, that's not really good Jack Kirby. It's better than a lot of stuff that's out there as far as like the concepts and the designs and the thoughts that, you know, the thought process behind it. Mm-hmm. And um, the fourth world stuff and the stuff beyond that that he did at DC once he left like Marvel. I mean, even some of the Marvel stuff, like you have the Inhumans mm-hmm. that, you know, Jack Kirby did, you know, Galactus, uh, you know, Silver Surfer, like all of these like concepts, these you know, these larger than life concepts that he managed to do in like this operatic fashion, Mm -hmm. you know, they greatly inspired me. And then when you get to like, you know, the fourth world stuff where he basically just created like this microcosm of just awesome, Mm -hmm. you know, um, starting with, you know, his Jimmy Olsen stuff that, you know, fed into like the new gods. And then you've got the forever people and Mr. Miracle and, you know, um, all the, you know, the, the nuttiness that he put in there that unfortunately he never got to like, you know, finish, mm-hmm. um, you know, and, and it's a shame too, because like the people who ran with it afterwards, it really bums me out that they keep trying to like shoehorn dark side into a lot of stuff, but it always falls flat to me because I don't think a lot of them really look deep, you know, deep enough into like the new gods or into that fourth world stuff to like understand it. You know, to them, they just got Dark Side. He's a big, he's a bad guy. Let's go punch Dark Side. And that was never Dark Side when uh, Jack Kirby was doing the New Gods, man. You know, he just never showed up for you to, you know, to to beat on. And the only person that, you know, would beat on him was his son, Orion. Um, you know, and it's, it, it just bums me out that, you know, you've got this character here that 
it's just so misused now. Yeah. Um, and a lot of times they, you know, the same with like, you know, Thanos, which he didn't create, but you know, you can see a lot of like Kirby DNA and Starlin's Thanos. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's the same thing, you know, but then again, Thanos started kind of lame. I mean, he was robbing banks and doing goofy stuff in the beginning. <laughs> he was just doing <laughs> stupid stuff. Um, but yeah, like Jack Kirby, everything that he created for the uh, fourth world, mm -hmm. he created and it was completely realized once it hit the page. Like when you look at those drawings and when you look at the book and even when you read it, mm -hmm. there is so much backstory that he has just impregnated each page with that it's all there. You know, there's nothing where it's like, well, we need to flesh this out. It's like, no, it's it, it all exists here. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, it's it's a shame that people know of it. But, you know, when you ask people, have you actually like, you know, read all of this stuff? You know, they're like, uh, you know, I, I dabbled a little bit. But, you know, I'm a total devotee to like uh, Jack Kirby and his stuff. Yeah. Um, you know, it's same with like the Eternals. Mm hmm. Um, read that first issue. If you read no other issue of the Eternals, read that first issue and it will give you everything you need to know about the Eternals. It's not, um, kind of like a lot of postmodern comic books where they've, uh, you know, uh, you're going to need, you know, 12 issues to get a single story. I mean, you could take one Kirby comic and spread that thing out over a year, but he would give you a year's worth of comic or comic, mm -hmm. you know, the same with, you know, the demon or commandy or OMAC, mm -hmm. um, just all of that stuff. Um, you know, silver star, uh, any of it. Mm -hmm. Um, he just, he, he, he piles it on and he's so thoughtful about it yeah. and obviously well read. Cause when you read it, you're like, okay, I can see like, you know, like his, uh, especially with like the eternals, his, uh, chariots of the gods phase or if you look at 2001 the comic book how like after the adaption of the actual movie he just went off and started doing other crazy stuff and that's where you get you know machine man and you know all these other weird cosmic things that you know people take for granted or you know you know yeah. like most of the marvel uh movies you would you wouldn't have without you know jack kirby and his uh you know his artistry it is. So, it yeah. is. It is known that he that he was an influence on pretty much all of the original image guys in one form or another. Uh, he was an, on all of everyone. I mean, even beyond like all the image guys who like you know they loved him, and you know even um, uh, published one of his comics that they all took a, uh, uh, you know a turn inking on. Mm -hmm. um, but like uh, you know the the two page spread that's mm -hmm. Jack Kirby man, mm -hmm. you know. Um, you know, the, the huge, uh, dynamic splash pages, that's all Jack Kirby. Like, uh, you know, look at, uh, comics that were done by his contemporaries when Jack Kirby was like doing comics, like, uh, at the height of his power, like in the, uh, uh, you know, the late sixties, early seventies. Yeah. And there's nothing that rivals his like dynamism on a page. And there's people who like, you know, uh, you know, took a few like cues from him, like, you know, Steranko. Mm -hmm. Um, but most of it, yeah, they're, it's fairly pedestrian when you put a Jack Kirby comic next to, you know, a Ross Andrew comic or, you know, even a Steve Ditko or, you know, you know, even people who, you know, you would consider like, you know, as good as Kirby weren't doing work as good as Kirby, you know, until like they got a little taste of that Jack Kirby in them. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, you started seeing, like, you know, magic. But, yeah, no, Jack Kirby, man. That guy is... Uh, I do wonder yeah. if, you ever, if you ever met um, Mobius at any point. I want to say he did in the late 80s. Or not late 80s. Late 70s, or early mm -hmm. 80s when he went to California when he was dabbling in animation. Because mm -hmm. I think Mobius... Um, let me see. Hold on. I might have a story for it. Cause I tell you, I love Jack Kirby. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. like, uh, and uh, I'm not sure if they ever did. I know they, you know, existed together because I've seen them in the same rooms together, you know, they when I used to go to conventions. But they I don't know. If they probably they probably did. It's just, it's just that, um, you know, I'm not I'm not saying that they ever that they ever did any sort of collaboration due, just due to the sheer distance between the two of them. Um, right. But. I could, e I could easily see them 
um, swapping notes in the same way that, or sw swapping notes or swapping letters in the same way that um, Lovecraft would swap no would swap notes with some of the other pulp authors of of his day, including Howard. Um, right. Probably probably not Hugo because for whatever re because for whatever reason he hated Hugo, even calling him the rat. Right. Um. But. The sec the second pillar that I want I want to go into is um, Lord of Light. Oh, by a little Roger Zelazny. Mm -hmm. Um, yep, that book, awesome. I used to uh, belong to a, a book club uh, back in the day. You know, we'd meet a mm -hmm. science fiction book club, and I think that's where I was hip to that one. Because you know, you'd go there, you'd talk about books you read, and then. The guy's house that we would meet at had this huge, crazy library, and I think that's where I picked that one up, or did I pick it up from my roommate? Mm -hmm. But that one was a paradigm shift as well. Um, a lot of people get into Lovza blah, uh, Zelazny through, like, you know, Amber, but I kind of found Amber kind of boring. I just I couldn't get through it. It was like, okay, this is uh, some high-level wankery here, but Lords of Light, um, that's the jam right there. And that one... You know, along with like, you know, the new gods and the Eternals. I'm not sure if you're familiar with the Lord of Light. Um, no, but... I have. I haven't. I haven't touched. I haven't touched on it in a in a while. I think I. I think I found out about it right, right around the time that I was go that I was going down a rabbit hole when it came to Tecumel. Right. Which. Tecumel is a is a story is a story in and in of itself, and if I go down that rabbit hole again, I'm not coming back. <laughs> right. Yeah. No, like, um, funny enough, there's a, uh, the connection between like Zelazny and Jack Kirby, mm -hmm. um, was that, uh, during like the, uh, uh, the, the hostage situation in Iran, um, remember like, uh, the government sent like, you know, a team in to, you know, a secret team in and they were supposed, their cover was they were filming a movie. Mm -hmm. That movie was going to be Lords of Light. And they had Jack Kirby do the concept art for it. So if you go online and look up concept art for Lords of Light, you'll see the Jack Kirby art that they did that they took to Iran <laughs> to show, you know, the officials like, see, we're making a movie. This is some of the concept art. That is the concept art was from, uh, you know, the movie they were making, the science fiction movie called Lord of Light. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, that one, yeah, the, the mythology in it, um, the... Um, you know the 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 tenets of Buddhism in it, um, and the science fiction of uh, Lord of Light is fantastic, and uh, it is it's 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 it was a game changer for me. It was really good, um, you know, and 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 to me, a pretty well thought out as far as like you know like the story was concerned for that one, and how like basically you know the people on the planet thought these guys were gods, and they would just kind of go down there, show up. Do their godlike thing and then go back, you know, back up to, you know, you know, their home, um, which is, you know, super high tech. But, you know, that was the cool part about it was that there was so much social engineering going on in that book. And that's where I stole, like, you know, some of the uh, the stuff for, you know, God's an agenda mm -hmm. um, that um, also his book, um, This Immortal. I'm not sure if you're familiar with that one about uh, this guy who's lived, you know, uh, an immortal but it's kind of neat to see stuff like that, mm -hmm. um, especially with a lot of older science fiction that is not bound by a lot of uh, restrictions that a lot of science fiction has now because of, um, you know, everything is world building now. So like when you get a book, you know, you're not getting a book, you're getting a book in a series of books. But a lot of like older science fiction, it was fire and forget, man. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you fire a book, you shoot a book off and it's done. Mm -hmm. And you might make, you know, another book in that same series, but the beautiful thing about a lot of like older science fiction and fantasy is that you didn't necessarily need to, you know, be involved in this entire, um, you know, the franchise of it. Um, well, you know, I think, instance, like, I think hmm? something that certainly contributed to that is the fact that a lot that a lot of a lot of um, writers were writing in. Uh, um, anthology, anthology books, you know, stuff like Weird Tales, where you're not going to have a whole lot of space or t or time to do a whole lot of world stuff. Uh, I would probably say it's uh, mostly just the 80s. Like, if you look at 
the codification of science fiction and fantasy, or actually a lot of genre fiction, it happened in like the late seventies, early eighties. Um, Cause before that, you know, there was just fiction and nonfiction. And this was a science fiction book. There was no kind of like, you know, like when radio did the same thing where they started codifying it mm -hmm. and splitting it up so that, you know, one station that played R&B can't possibly play rock music, you know, or this station is an oldie station. They can't play anything contemporary. And so, you know, FM, you know, radio changed. Um, you know, a lot of uh, uh, books changed uh, in that sense, too, because before that, like, you know, you, you still had novels. You still had, like, you know, people who were writing tons of books. But when people started writing for, like, um, the franchise or writing for, like, you know, whatever intellectual property they were writing for, mm -hmm. that's when books started getting goofy. Like, yeah. uh, like all the, uh, what is it, the David Edding books where, you know, those things just, they're just painful. Like, uh, I, I saw that, tra uh, that trap coming and, you know, got out of the way of it. Mm -hmm. But... You know, some books, you know, I got trapped in and that's the way fiction, you know, genre fiction is now. It's all, uh, you know, codified into a thing and there are rules to it that make it all samey and uninspired. I, um, Where... when it comes, when it comes to the idea of, when it comes to the idea of rules, I've, I've never been, I've never been ag against it. What I have been, ag what I have been against is what I call designed by gospel. Right. Um, I told I think I told you in the past how I w how when um when to when Tome of Power came out for D came out for D&D &D in the early 2000s, I was I was one of the Mavericks that defended it. Because right. what because what it was because first off any anything that makes fight that made martial characters actually be able to contribute to what they're supposed to is not is something I'm not going to turn my nose at. And se right. and second, the que the um the argument that I kept the argument that I kept seeing was that it was was that it was turning it was that it was somehow wrong to take inspiration from video games or for or from or from manga and this was right around the time that. that we were seeing that first huge huge wave of um, anime start starting to come starting to come into the consciousness, and I had I had my response was a lot of the stuff that was it that was in that was in those early waves of role playing games was based on stuff that the creators happened to like, and right. with with new forms of with new forms of media new forms of stories you're going to see that exact same thing, and. I I said that about I said I said that around 20 years ago, and I think history has bo has borne me out. Right. Well, <laughs> just keep going back even further. Mm -hmm. I mean, you can see like, and most of it, no matter what type of artist you are. Let's mm -hmm. say you are a chef. Let's say uh, you are a painter. You know, whatever influences you, that's what's gonna go inside your little toolkit that you're gonna use to make your thing. Mm -hmm. I mean, look at like um. A lot of like the kind of uh, a Tomo influence on the artwork and you know the original Mechton games. Like it's not as good as Tomo's work. However, you can see his style like bleeding through into a lot of the illustrations there, especially in Mechton Zeta. Oh yeah. Um, but uh, and you know you can see um, you know some of the anime influences in the Cyberpunk you know 2013 and 2020 game. Mm -hmm. um, you good. know obviously you can see some of the the actual cyberpunk writers, but there's a lot, you know, of anime influence in, uh, you know, those two uh, iterations of uh, cyberpunk. By, the, by yeah. the way, good dodge not mentioning cyberpunk third edition. Oh no. You know what? <laughs> I will, I didn't mind cyberpunk third edition. I no. thought that game was the most punk out of all of those games. Um, <laughs> I, I love that thing. I, I like the game, but I, but I, but um, as I've, as I said before, I am from Minnesota. And what else right. is from Minnesota? Mystery Science Theater. Right. So, t so I am an I am a natural riffer, and as one of my colleagues often says, "All's fair in love and riffing," or as right. I as I go with it, we hold these truths to be self evident that all men are cremated equal. Right. <laughs> um, well, it depends too, because yeah, if you're a bigger person, you're going to use a lot more fuel. 
Still- funny enough, I, I found out it takes almost, what is it? Um, how many gallons to cremate a body? I think it was 20 gallons of fuel to cremate a body. Mm-hmm. Or you can just do it with tires if uh, you're out in the, the wilderness and you need to dump a body. <laughs> but don't dump bodies in the wilderness with and make tire fires. It's not good for the environment. <laughs> Uh, but the third pillar I wanted I wanted to go into is the is the work of DKM, right? Yep. Yeah, that one. Those were some books that were given to me by like a friend. Like, gosh, yeah, this was way back in the olden days in the '90s. And at the time, there were uh, three of those books. Uh, since then, he's written more, which you know I probably need to catch up on. Mm-hmm. But you know. Um, those three books, I think, uh, Emerald Eyes, uh, The Long Run, and The Last Dancer. Mm-hmm. And what's cool about those, I don't know if you're familiar with uh, Daniel Keyes Moran's work on those books, but you know, science fiction, uh, fictiony, uh, a story that you know, basically, the first two books are very cyberpunkish, mm-hmm. or have a lot of like cyberpunk in them, but by The Last Dancer. You know, they basically take you back in time. You know, you get to see prehistory and like what's going on and like, you know, this race of beings who like, you know, come to Earth thousands of years ago mm-hmm. and, you know, do a thing, um, you know, which feeds back into like, uh, you know, Lord's of Light and feeds back into, you know, Jack Kirby's, you know, the new gods and the Eternals. Mm-hmm. So all of those things all have like kind of the same elements in them, just kind of like uh, packaged a little bit differently. So with those uh, three ideas, you know, taken from here, taken from there, that's when you get, you know, the uh, the Godson agenda. Like basically the, the I don't know if you read The Last Dancer, but there's a group of characters who are warriors slash um, they're, they're essentially prison guards and they are chasing, you know, these dancers, you know, all over the place. Um, and you know, hundreds of years go by thousands of years and they're still chasing these people cause they're fanatics. And that was, uh, what was cool about it. And those characters became the Angelos and God's an agenda. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, basically, you know, prison guards are, you know, soldiers who have to complete their mission. This is their mission. They need to complete it. It doesn't matter if it takes, you know, 6,000 years, they will complete that mission, you know? Um, and yeah, so all three of those things you you know you put into a little blender, um, mix it up, pour it into like you know your uh, your uh, Pruno ta- uh, tank, and uh, distill out uh, the Godson agenda mm-hmm. at the other end, and probably a lot of other stuff that I've created because uh, I think dang near everything that I do kind of has some of the elements from a lot of like the the media that I consume mm-hmm. in it. So yeah, and um. I do think, even the even though I I've seen I've seen some people try and write, try to write about God's Godsend and call, and call it a superhero game, which it definitely it definitely is. But at the same time, given what you mentioned about about that whole categorization thing, um, mm-hmm. I feel like I feel like calling it that is is sell, is selling it a bit short. Plus, as I t- as I talked about with some with somebody yesterday. Um, Saying saying that you're going to run a superhero campaign only tells you just enough to piss you off, <laughs> right? Well, also too, what always kills me is that um, it always bums me out when the person who wants to run the superhero game they don't know any type of they've never really read any of the media they haven't really consumed any of the media they might have watched um, a season of Young Justice and to them that is superheroes but there's so much more. Um, and I, I think about it like this. Um, let's say, for instance, you're a fan of Prince, right? Which I am. But Are you, are you pandering because Minnesota? No, I'm pandering <laughs> because I, I love Prince. <laughs> but let's say, um, you know, if, if I was pandering, I might have uh, brought up like Kirby Puckett or something. But uh, <laughs> Okay, now you're pushing it. <laughs> but uh, no, I'm uh, no. But for instance, like with Prince... Mm-hmm kind of doing his own thing even though like you can put it in different categories uh prince i actually also like fishbone mm-hmm. um another like a uh, musical group that i really like mm-hmm. you can put them in a category but there's so much more than that 
And if you just said, like, is it funk? It's like, well, yeah, it is funk. Is it, you know, is it R&B? It's like, yeah, it's R&B. Is it some rock? It's like, yeah, there's some rock in there. You know, there's some blues. There's some jazz. But it's no one thing. It is it is an amalgam of all these things that make it uniquely its own. Yeah. Um, and, you know, not to toot my horn, which I'm getting ready to do because I can because I took out a rib. Um, <laughs> what I think sets um, the Godson agenda apart from a lot of other superhero games, because if you wanted to play a superhero game, there are so many good ones out there. Mm-hmm. I would suggest you go play like Bash or you go play, you know, Mutants and Masterminds or, you know, get in on some of this champions or champions now or, you know, or brave new world, you know, if you wanted to, uh, you know, go back or, you know, there's, there's a ton of games that you could be playing. Mm -hmm. Um, but a lot of them are all trying to, especially the ones that aren't licensed that are, you know, superhero games or, you know, they're all trying to give you that same flavor of just comic books. And they never go beyond that because, a lot of comic books, you know, are basically, since they're all franchises, since they're all intellectual properties, they're always striving to give you a story that will allow them to continue on with the status quo. And Godson Agenda doesn't try to do that because Godson Agenda is pretty much a superhero adjacent game. Mm-hmm. It's not, you know, the, in, in Godson Agenda, you're not concerned about, um, uh, you know, someone poisoning the water supply or a bank robbery. Um, because you literally have the power of a god. Hmm. And, you know, and uh, and when I say that, a lot of people, you know, they'll default to like, you know, Thor or Superman or something like that. But, you know, Blue Beetle or, uh, you know, uh, Hawkeye or, you know, those people I would consider as well because they have such tremendous ability to make substantive changes in their environment because, you know, they are doing the work. Um that why are you concerned with like you know a bank robbery the bank is insured you know and the really the only people you're protecting are the you know the the land barons you're uh you're protecting the people who are usually involved in like making the world miserable so god's an agenda is like if you had the power of a god what would you do with it you know would you try and change yeah. the world and if so that is god's an agenda mm-hmm. you know it's not about like for instance in god's an agenda you can literally have an agenda because an agenda is a thing in God's an agenda, funny mm-hmm. enough. <laughs> that if you said, you know what? Let's go take out um, some terrorist groups like, you know, these white nationalists, uh, these proud boys, or, or you know, we're going to go take care of the Klan. You could do that in God's an agenda. And there's rules for it, you know. Whereas in a comic book, Superman might, you know, dabble in messing with the Klan, you know. Black Panther might have fought the Klan, but at the end of the day, you know, you've got a character who can actually do something about it, but they never do. Mm -hmm. And that's what, uh, you know, and I get it why they do it in comic books. I love comics. You know, I've been reading comics since like the 70s, uh, late 70s, because I'm not super old. I'm just old. But, uh, you know, they they defend the status quo. Like, you, you will never see Reed Richards go, you know what, guys? I've traveled to other dimensions. I've dealt with all sorts of alien uh, uh, empires. Guys, here's your cure for cancer. You know, it, that never happens. You know, why isn't the Shi'ar giving us the cure for cancer? Why isn't, you know, uh, Mr. Fantastic, you know, with his flying car going, hey, guys, here's an energy alternative that uh, will, you know, stop polluting the world. Here's clean energy. Why, aren't the, why, aren't the Wakanda, why, why can't the Wakandas go one day without a stick up their ass? Right. Well, because, you know, don't knock it till you try it, man. <laughs> don't knock it till you try it. Lay on your yeah. left side, put your knees <laughs> up to your chest, and, uh, you know. I'm just saying, I'm the, Waka- Wakanda, has been, Wakanda has been my whipping boy for years, and to the point where, to the point where I called them African elves. Right. Well, they are. They, they, are, the, they are literally the magic Negro. But, um, yeah, you in those comics, the status quo is always defended because things, even when you do, you know, your earth shattering crossover, it goes back to the same. You know, you can have zero hour, you can have a crisis, you can have the secret invasion. But at the end of the day, you know, no one's solved like, you know, the energy crisis. No one's like, you know, uh, solved income uh, inequality and God's an agenda. You can't, you know, um, if I'm being because- a, if I'm being honest. The mm-hmm. the times the times that I have pitched 
um, Godsend agenda to my students when I went at one of the places I used to be at, and at that t at that time I was I was using um, second edition. Mm -hmm. Is I would t I would tell them to I would tell them to think of to think of a more a more contemporary a more contemporary look with stuff like Exalted. Right. Um. Is more re more recently with Godbound because. I yep. I didn't care I didn't care f I didn't care for some for some of the things that were changed between second and third edition Exalted and that whole Exalted is Wuxia and mythology was a mass from one of, from one of the people at Onyx Path I think was a master class in missing the point. Right. <laughs> uh, I it's it's kind of it's kind of like saying that that um that just because something is all ages me means that it's for kids because I remember seeing that with certain um, Doctor Who episodes, right? Where the well, it was though, but you know we've that's like back that's in the day. The, be, the point I'm getting at is that is that looking at it as just that just that one thing is missing the forest for the trees because of all the other things that it can be and has been. Right. Um, I'd also and the. The other the other game that I that I would prob I would probably bring up in in a somewhat different sense to get to kind of e to kind of ease people in when it comes to something like Godsend is Scion. You could do Scion. I mean, those are they're two different games, and the, you know they're coming at you. What I would say is um, the difference with Godsend Agenda, not to say like Scion is you know crappy or anything like that, because it's it's its own thing, mm -hmm. you know. It's just that uh, what I want to do, or my design, uh, what I'm trying to do with my design is basically make you proactive mm -hmm. in the sense that the world's not passive. And in a lot of games, especially superhero games, you passively wait for the game master to say, this is what happened, as opposed to going, guys, Let's create a pantheon, which you do in God's and Agenda. Mm -hmm. um, and the pantheon is a character. Yeah. And basically the pantheon is a gestalt amalgam or just a gestalt of the player characters in the game. So, you know, the pantheon is only as strong or is only as capable um, as the people in the pantheon. So if you've got, you know, uh, you know, basically the, 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 the attributes will translate. Mm -hmm. And with that pantheon, you go after agendas, which are built kind of like characters. Um, and the thing is, is that's what I wanted to do. Um, and it's um, like, it's it, to me, it's low hanging fruit. Like, for instance, when, you know, anyone who plays and they go, I want to play a mythological character. And so I'm the son of Thor. Or I'm the son of, you know, whatever. As opposed to, but, you know, the games are always trying to limit you on what you can do in that particular milieu. Uh, even though that, you know, on the tin, they say you can change the world. A lot of them don't really mean it because they never really give you the tools to do so. And that you can only change the world as long as the game master allows you to. But my philosophy is that the game master is just another player character. He just happens to have just a different sets of responsibilities. You know, he is not the alpha and omega. He's just, you know, either the guy that you're going over to his house or a uh, lady or non-binary person, whatever the case may be. Um, and, uh, you know, and, you know, you guys are playing a game together as opposed to being, you know, dictated to. So mm -hmm. with the agendas, you know, if we're all sitting at a table and we decide, hey, guys, um, we're going to clean up this town, you know, mm -hmm. and not by just, you know, doing this. We're going after you know, the big wigs, we're going to uh, take out the mayor and maybe not take him out, but, you know, uh, uh, you know, get rid of him in a not so murderous way. I guess I keep saying it in a murderous way, but, uh, <laughs> but, you know, it's, 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 it's its own thing. It's a postmodern uh, mythology um, that is heavily influenced with like a ton of science fiction because in God's agenda, there is no magic. I mean, I guess there's stuff you could call magic, but I mean, you know, you could call the force magic or call psychic uh, abilities magic, but you know, it's Clark's law. That's all I'm going to say. Right. But 
No, that's uh, you know, the Godson agenda. Mm -hmm. But yes, is it uh, it's superheroish, but it's not a superhero game. Yeah. In the sense that you know we're doing four color stuff. Mm -hmm. Um, and again, like I say, like people have asked me, can I do this with it? Can I make Superman? And it's like I, I kind of hope not. You know, and I'm not saying it to be an ass. It's just there's so many other games that you could do that and have so much fun doing, and it would be such a struggle for you to try to shoehorn in that sensibility into Square a game that's not around hole. Yeah, it's like it's like there's so many other games that will do it so much better. You know, why struggle with you know the same with the uh, Hellas when you know people would ask me, can I you know can we play Star Wars with it? It's like you can, but why not go play a Star Wars game? There's you know there's better games to play Star Wars than you know a Greek space opera game. You know, um, and that's kind of what I do. I create uh, games with a milieu, uh, uh, you know, a hardwired, a hard baked, uh, 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 you know, milieu inside the game. Um, yeah, I, um, I have, I have been very, I, I've been very critical of the of this this mindset that a lot of people have of using using a using a given game to ru to run just about anything. Um, right, I'm a I'm a firm believer in system does matter. Right, and yep. while there's certain games that you can definitely do a wide variety of of that with, um, that doesn't mean that doesn't mean that any game should that any game should. I mean, there's a yeah. there's, it's like when it comes, you won't you won't hear you won't hear that kind of could could you do Superman kind of thing with um, a lot of the games in the World of Darkness line because of how intrinsic linked they are to their particular setting um right you could could you it could you in theory um write up blade in the modern knights in theory but you but that but um it but it's it, it's one of those good idea on pa on paper kind of things because you're gonna be doing a hell of a lot of work just trying to figure out what the hell um clan you go with with him well, and that's just it. You get stuck, mm -hmm. and you know that 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 would be your first problem is that you're stuck in trying to figure out what clan it is. You're trying again to fit something to fit the sensibilities of that game. And me personally, I'd say throw all that out. You know, like uh, the last time I threatened to run like a World of Darkness game because <laughs> people were like, "Yeah, come on, Jerry, you should run a, a vampire game for us." And I was like, "No, run, run, a run game, mage." Run, yeah. run Mage and the make them Mage cry. is awesome. I love Mage. <laughs> but the thing is, is like, you know, they were like, yeah. And I was like, I would. But if I do, you know, you guys are going to be disappointed because I'm not going to use all these clan books. And, uh, you know, because that was what jazzed me up the first time I played it back in the olden days, like the early 90s, was that there was so much wonder still and so much adventure, you know, nascent potential in that game. In the uh, you know, in that original vampire game, mm -hmm. that got beaten out of it by the time, uh, right before they they killed it and rebooted the line into um, you know the uh, the new world of darkness in the early two thousands, mm -hmm. because they had basically splatted everything. It was like, you want to know about this? Here's all of this. So there was no place to go, and you know the cool part and the bad part is is that everyone owned all the books, you know, when you would play D and D not everyone owned all the books, you know, so you, you, there's still stuff you could surprise people with, but yeah, vampire, that thing was a monster, uh, pun intended. I mean, uh, mm -hmm. publishing wise, wow. that thing is awesome because yeah, that thing had a sell through just like with riff books, riff books and vampire books and white wolf books had such incredible sell through and that it, you know, it was, it was insane. Um, I I was I will I will admit that when it came to the storyteller system, I spent more time with Exalted than I did with the World of Darkness. And I think right. a, I think a, I think a good chunk of it is because there was more stuff I could get I could get away with. Because while right. the, while there, while there's certain there's certain cities and there's certain places and obviously the different exalts that that people are going to be aware of there's a lot more wiggle room in creation than there is in the modern knights right well there's also like um in the original exalted because yeah, i tapped out after uh uh the first edition 
Like I thought about getting into second edition, but I was so exhausted from running it mm-hmm. that uh, I couldn't go back. Um, but again, uh, another game that, um, you know, is really, really cool, but in a way kind of suffers from its success because instead of people talking about really cool stories, anytime I would get to a conversation, everyone's just talking about a build, you know? And it's like, that is so not fun to me. Like when people are like, yeah, I've got this build here and it's got this charm and he does this and done it. And you're just like, I'm done. I'm ready to get out of here. And, you know, I'm pushing the tap out button because to me, that's not role playing. To me, that's just lonely fun. And, you know, lonely fun is good, but lonely fun is meant to be lonely fun. You know, uh, it's, it, you know, it's. It, it bores me. <laughs> yeah. It's painful. But you know? um, uh, that that being said, that being said, there are there are a cer- there are certain questions that I that I all that I always and I always end up asking whenever mm-hmm. it whenever it comes to supers or super adjacent games due to this being mm-hmm. a, a bit of a, a bit of a trap that you that you can't really get rid of but you can't but can be mitigated in some ways. And that—that that is what I've what I have called analysis paralysis, um, right? Where the, where there's just this huge variety of pot- of potential choices when it co- especially especially in games that are point by, that for a new for a newcomer it's di- it's they, it's difficult to figure out what they're what they're going to go go with at this at the start. In order to match the idea, especially if they want to match a certain idea that they have and the, they have in their head, um, mutants and masterminds that, that always, has that always comes from old players though, because if you get a new player, mm-hmm. they don't really have that uh, paralysis like older players do, because older players are always trying to maximize and validate their choices. Where a new I've, player, I've just seen, makes it I actually have seen it in new in um, new players. Yeah, large, but largely what I'm because... saying is that the majority of it comes from like like players going. I've got so many choices, and instead of making a character, they're looking through choices, looking for options that they can build a character with. Oh, you know what I mean? Oh, I, um, I, I, so let's mm-hmm. let's say, for instance, you're playing D and D, right? And let's say you're playing just old school, just D and D. I'm playing a dwarf. I'm playing an elf, right? Mm-hmm. And from if you go from that point of view, then you start adding on stuff that is more story based onto your character. You know what I mean? Because you have, you've got a basic character. Everyone's got the same basic character, but now we're making them, you know, mm-hmm. different because my character talks with a funny accent or my character comes from this place. But a lot of times I've noticed, especially with like um, superhero or point based games is that the paralysis comes from, is my character going to be viable in this game? And to me, that's a shame because they're always trying to build and even if they're not min maxers, they're trying to build. They don't want to be the, an anchor, right? But the thing is, is if it's a good enough game, you never will be an anchor. You know, mm-hmm. if it's and and not necessarily game as in you know it's if it's a good enough game system, but if the people at the table because I've played with people who like you know in champions, who are like they are mavens of like champion, and they will figure out to like the half point how to build a character and how to get you everything Mm -hmm. but when i would make my characters with them it would start upsetting them because i'm just building a character and they're like but you know you could save five points by doing this and i'm like listen dude i'm this is my character you know and they're it's it's blowing their minds that my character is not maximized to their full potential but that i just built a character that i wanted to play and i think if you come at it from like looking at like just a skill list and a powers list you will come away with like, oh my God, I could have flight. I can have, you know, quantum manipulation. I can have this mm-hmm. as opposed to going, you know what, guys, I'm going to build, um, you know, this guy who just teleports and it's like, oh, then all you need is teleport. I'm done, you know, but some people they'll be like, I want teleport, but then I need a, a defensive power and I need a, an offensive power. Um, and let's say, for instance, we go back to like a lot of older comic books. And uh, one of the characters that bums me out that they changed was Angel. Angel was the coolest character ever. And you know what Angel's power was? Angel could fly. He had wings. Mm -hmm. But late 80s, Angel got knives for wings. That guy got super strong. Like, you know, he had to have like all these, you know, defensive powers and offensive powers. But 
a lot of characters, when you look at like a lot of like Bronze Age or Silver Age characters, mm -hmm. they have a power and they are viable characters without having to have like 10 different powers and like stop gaps that prevent them from this happening. And if I got to, you know, do this, I need a skill for that. I, um, um, I have, I have set up a, I, I did a while back on the podcast, I did a little experiment using a, using a random power set generator from my days with Marvel Heroic, which is right. a game I really loved. Um, and we created 10, we created 10 characters out of, out of it. And oh, with a lot of crazy and beautiful, with a lot of the a lot of the character a lot of the character concepts and the power sets, are fairly are um fairly simple. The two the two protagonists with that um. Finn Hako is is the first one whose whose whole whole power set is is literally based on the concept of what a kitsune could do. You know, okay, a little a little. So it, there's definitely multiple things, whether it be illu whether it be illusions or, um, f or fire, but it's but it's a reflection of, the of that whole Kitsune thing. Um, the other one, um, Kyle Bridger, A.K. who has the nickname of Jet Falcon, his whole his whole gimmick is being is being a technomancer. There are there are a few limit there are a few limitations, namely that he has to understand what he's messing with, but he's not too far removed from forge back back in the day with back in the day with x-men when it comes to his use of technology right um and all that all they used to do to interface with any sort of technology is just to be touching it that's li that's but what he does what he does with it is cre is create an exosuit for himself that only he can really use because it's built with his powers in mind right um there was another there was another one who whose whole whose whole whose whole gimmick was um me was messing around with messing around with um space time you know create creating gra creating gravity wells or creating gravity null zones um i th and one and one more whose whole whose whole gimmick was just was just get was just get was just size changing and we dis and we decide and when it came to developing a, developing a character's quirks we decided that he is a, that he is what w what would happen if the mountain from game of thrones was was the was the wholesome gym rat that i that i'd always meet whenever i'd go work out cuz right <laughs> um the thing the thing that the, a thing that i ended up learning when i start when i started when i started really going into my going into my weight loss program mm -hmm. um that the the whole the whole gym douche that a lot of people th a lot of people think happens in gyms, um, not really the case. Gym rats are some of the most whole are some of the most wholesome, supportive motherfuckers you will find. <laughs> right. See, that's good. Yeah, because uh... um, I will admit that one of the influences with the character was um, Colossus because I like because I like Colossus. <laughs> right. Yeah, he's a nice guy. Have you ever uh, made a um, a random superhero gay guy, um, like uh, like in Vigilants and Vigilantes, where like you just roll on these charts and then you just that come was up with, how like, that was know? how we created this power set. It was a I used a program that ge that generated a power set randomly. Yeah, see, that's beautiful. I like um, that. <laughs> one, <laughs> that of, one of them was power mimicry, and I had to think, okay, I okay, power mimicry is what is what we've we have power mimicry and constructs. How am I going to make this work? And yeah. the solution was a was a character who can who can mimic effects of powers, but they can't do it directly. They create constructs which mimic that effect, and it that kind of thing evolved into a character who st who styles themselves as a as a as an as an old school pike and shot um commander. Even to even when it, when it came to getting the design down pat i ended up looking at a lot of military uniforms from the 17th and 16th centuries you see to me that sounds neat that uh because you know what mm -hmm. here's actually here's a good thing that I, uh someone said it's actually the it was the guitarist uh from uh king crimson mm -hmm. <laughs> he said that uh expectation 
It's a prison. And when I sat and let that marinate, it blew my mind. I was like, <laughs> he's right. Like, there's so much expectation that goes on, especially in these role-playing games, that people have an expectation of what the game should be, but no one ever just, you know, kind of looks at what the game is. Um, but the thing is, is once you let go of that expectation, these games are super awesome, man. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, like looking back at like, you know, let's say Villains and Vigilantes. Mm -hmm. um, it's got a lot of funky quirks in it, but I had a lot of fun playing that game, man. And it was like, uh, but, you know, like uh, going back to the paralysis thing, there's been so much, you know, like lately, like characters are so proprietary and there's so much, I guess, like guarded control over, you know, your particular character mm -hmm. that they've, they've lost that, that, that spark, that, oh, what's the word that, that, that piece of potential that was in there. Mm -hmm. Like when you would get like, when you'd roll up a character, let's say again in D and D and you're like, oh man. You know, I, I kind of wanted to play like a, a paladin, but uh, I got a lot of nines and twelves here on this character sheet. And you're like, well, what can I make? And it's like, I could easily make a thief or I can make a really poor and badly thought out magic user. Mm -hmm. You know, <laughs> it's just like, yeah, let's just make this magic user. Is He's that, like the, is that the reason? Is that the reason why you put why you're putting in a why you're putting in, in a um, life path in this book? The life paths, uh, you know what the life path is? a piece of technology from cyberpunk 2020 mm -hmm. and but um it's also there um as a piece of world building mm -hmm. so as you're playing as you're going through the life path you're actually learning the background of the game and learning what the game is about mm -hmm. um and yes i'm also like a fan of like life paths that like um like for instance like anytime as a player when i'm playing in a game and there's that option where you can roll randomly to get something as mm -hmm. opposed to like, though the, the charts always say, you know, pick one or roll randomly. Mm -hmm. I'm always rolling random because whatever I get in this gumbo, I'm going to make it work, mm -hmm. you know? And I get like, um, um, what game were we playing where the, the guy who, the GM, like he kind of flipped out, man. Cause, uh, my wife and I, we were playing and she likes to roll random too. Mm -hmm. So we were like, yeah, let's just roll this. You know, this character is going to be straight up random. And he was like, why would you do that to your character? And I'm like, because this is the character I'm getting ready to play, man. This character, trust me, he's going to be as viable as your character or the characters in the game. But the thing is, is, you know, you get a little bit of this, you get a little bit of that. And it's like, well, all right, I'm making a character out of this. It's getting ready to work. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we worked it. I worked it like a rib. And I had fun because it was so not any preconceived notion of what I wanted a character in this game to be. It mm -hmm. was what the system gave me. And so I trusted the system to give me a character. Mm -hmm. um, the same in like Hellas uses the life path. The same in uh, Atlantis uh, uses the life path. Mm -hmm. And if you trust the life path, you will end up with something that might not necessarily be what your character concept or your expectation was, but it'll be something that will allow you to, think differently you know you'll come at it from a different angle as opposed to you know again i need a character that has a really good offensive skill i need a, you know a really good defense i need this i need that mm -hmm. it's like you come up with a character and you're like damn my character is this now i guess and it's magic man it's mm -hmm. uh to me it's 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 there's more magic in that than us just sitting down with a you know a pen and a paper and just going through whatever feats we need to, you know, a feat tree so that I can get this one awesome thing so I can do it. And in order for me to do it, I need to be this particular class and have, you know, this stuff. It's like, you know, we call the it, around here. We call that pay not to suck, pay not to suck. Is that what it is? Pay not to suck. I yeah. like sucking just, you know, like when I'm laying there with my knees up on my ankles and, uh, <laughs> or up on my chest, okay. I'm, uh, I'm sucking too, well, but, it's it's it, you get so, like for instance uh, another thing or another design philosophy, uh, and this drives people crazy sometimes, but I think that game balance is a fallacy. That all it does is it um, it makes the least, I guess. Mm, I don't want to say least creative because that just sounds like a jerk, but the least, it basically gives you 
a sense of safety that's not really there, you know, because there's always going to be that person who knows the system in and out and will be able to maximize the system, no matter how finely balanced the system purports to be, there will always be that person who can do it better than you. You know what I mean? So why not uh, play the character? Like, for instance, in a superhero game, you know, people are like, well, how come he gets to play Superman and I get to play Blue Beetle? And it's like, well, maybe because you like playing Blue Beetle. If you don't like playing Blue Beetle, don't play Blue Beetle, you know? But, you know, if, 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 if my fun is predicated on making your character feel viable, you know, it's, it's, it kind of takes away from, like, my fun as well, you know? And a lot of, like, so-called game balance kind of does that because it punishes the actual narrative of the game by saying we need to all fit inside this box. And some of the best games don't fit in a box. Um, you know, that's where that's where all the awesome story lies is, you know, not creating a dungeon that is a first-level dungeon. You know, create a dungeon, throw out some rumors that there might be a dragon, and if the first-level players want to go in that dungeon, they go in that dungeon. I'm not saying the dragon needs to kill them, but there's a dragon in there, you know. Um, you know, it's it's not about, I guess, you know, it's not about, like, putting on all the safety equipment. That's uh, kind of the way I kind of like playing is get rid of some of the safety equipment and let's go for it, man. Although you should wear a helmet if you're riding a bike. That's uh Yes, you, yes, match. you should. Yes, you should. And as somebody who's, as somebody who's worked in insurance, um, never, t never come up to me and say, I wasn't planning on having an accident. Yeah. Cause <laughs> I'm, I just had one right now. And, uh, this room is getting ripe. <laughs> God, that's t okay. Okay. Yeah. Moving. Right. But some people pay good money for that. Yeah. So I'm um, just going to save it in a bag. But what are you? What are you? What are you? Are you gonna? Are you gonna auction off the? Are you gonna auction off the bag of ret, of Kobe's retirement retirement air or something? That's right. Well, it's like the uh, that lady who was selling her farts. Uh, yeah, did, yeah, uh, and then she had to go to the hospital. Yeah, well, it's because of her diet, man. You get you. And plus, I would be disappointed because those aren't real natural farts; those are manufactured. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, if I'm buying farts, I want an authentic yeah. fart. Um, one thing that when I was looking through the preview, one thing that stood out that stood out to me, and this mm -hmm. may, this may be a bit uh, this may be a bit of an odd choice. Um, yes, is the, the way the the way the character sheet was designed. Specific, specifically, the fact that when it came to the, just just laying out the core, just laying out the core attributes and the like, mm -hmm. that is that is a blatant nod to the Sephiroth if I've ever seen one. And oh this, yeah, because that's where I took it from. Yeah. <laughs> and well, the reason yeah, why that stood out to me is because I haven't I haven't really seen any designer, um, make make that kind of nod to the Sephiroth since Anima. Right. Yeah, you, you gotta um gosh, where have I seen it? Oh well, they uh did it in Colt, if you look at their character sheets. Oh yeah, character Col sheets, yeah, Colt it. Colt is Colt um, um But yeah, like Kabbalistic stuff and Gnostic stuff, I'm all about it, man. Yeah. I love like uh weird religious magic and um you know, the kind of weird metaphysical stuff of like um you know, uh religions. Mm-hmm. To me, that's the coolest thing. And, you know, that's all the stuff that, like, I will take and put into, like, God's an Agenda. Like, mm -hmm. uh, like I, I, ooh, I so wish that in, like, the first century, we, uh, that uh, Gnosticism had a, a, a better marketing people <laughs> because it is so much cooler. <laughs> it's oh. so much cooler, man. Yeah, it but is... I, I, will, I will always, I will always appre appreciate when, when design, when designers, um, take, take some time to get to, Put, to put in more of an ident put in more of a visual identity with um, character sheets, um, right? This is this is the reason why a lot of I don't think in the entire time that I've run any any White Wolf game I have never used the stock character sheet. I've always used a custom one or or um, just used one of the many sheets from Mister Gone, right? Which is why it's funny as as all hell that they that Onyx Path decided to cut out the middleman and just hire him directly to do their character sheets. Yeah. Well, it's it's an artifact of the game, mm -hmm. you know. It is a it is a tangible piece of the game that you're interfacing with, mm -hmm. and stuff like that. It it should like um, like there's some players like there's a guy I play with. He's all about just you know uh, a piece of notebook. He goes old school with it, um, mm -hmm. but 
old school, I was the guy who would get the graph paper and my markers, and I would draw up a character sheet, and I would try to make the coolest, most functional character sheet. And character sheets are hard, man, because mm -hmm. especially like trying to get all the information on there and then make it accessible. It's hard. Like, uh, it it is it is hard. <laughs> it is a it is a a skill unto itself uh, to make uh, things look interesting and to make you want to engage with it. And like anytime you see like a well laid out and designed like a uh, book, like game book mm -hmm. that makes it fun and easy to read, hats off, man, to the uh, the graphic designer and the layout person because. That stuff is hard. That is, uh, yeah, that that is a skill unto itself. You know, mm -hmm. forget the rules. Like you know, like I've uh, been excited by games that were just poorly put together, but they look good. Mm -hmm. So you're like, you know what? I'm gonna try to make this thing work. And then you know, after obviously you know a few sessions, you're like, okay, I, I can't make this work, but it looks good. You know? I I have a, I have a soft spot for the for the um, sheet design in um, sh in Shadow of the Demon Lord. As one, right. as one example, um, some of the, the some of the some of the um, there was there was there were some there were some very interesting custom ones. I remember I remember seeing for things like Aegon and Spirit of the Century. Yep. Um, as well as well as a go as well as a Gone, which I would have liked to see more of, but I can't speak French. Um, <laughs> I loved the. I um I loved. I love the ver I love the vertical design of the sheet in um, Tenra, Tenra Bancho Zero. Mm, right. Um. There's, and the and um, there's been there's been there's been a few there's been a few others, um, and of course of course one of the one of the undisputed kings these days is the sheet that's used for Lancer. Right. Well, well Lancer's a really uh, good looking game. Mm -hmm. It's a and it's a very nice looking game and very well laid out. Yeah, I do enjoy that one or looking at it. Yeah, uh, I haven't actually played it yet. I I have I have um and something and something like CompCon is a absolute godsend. It's it's basic it's basically a char a character sheet ma uh, management kind of thing, right? Like what, like what D and D Beyond is for Fifth Edition. It's except mm. that it's free, right? Um, but the but um, of course, of course, of course, um, there are there are there are some character sheets that have been my that have been my whipping boy on on the why did you design it that way? The big one recently has been the default character sheet design for Pathfinder Second Edition, which is just ugly. Bowling right. too ugly, as Jim Ross would say. But does it have everything on it? Um, because <sighs> that's the thing. Like with character sheets that have a lot of stuff, I'm telling you, it is hard trying to get everything on a character sheet, man. Mm -hmm. Especially when you have to put in all the little words that are, you know, derived from that attribute and the saves. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I can only imagine. But let's see, what time is it? It is. Yeah. Ooh, it's getting late. But um, I I know we can I know we kind of went all kind of went all over the all over the place. Yeah, but, as, but that's good though. I, I like as, that. As um, as I now as I understand as I understand it, you're go you're going with um, you're going with um God the Godsend Agenda Core Book is going to be about two hundred and fifty pages, and um, Pan and Pantheon is one hundred and twenty eight pages. Um. Yep. It, well, it is or it was, but um, things happened. Well, yeah. As of today, because you know, because since we hit like you know the goal, mm -hmm. um, I like to underpromise and overdeliver. Mm -hmm. So the book's probably going to be closer to three hundred fifty pages. Um, you know, just because I'm just going to just pack everything in the the one thing that I always try to do with a lot of the books that I do, mm -hmm. you know, um, is give you a complete game. So if you only own one book, uh, that book you should be able to use and you should be able to play um, and have, you know, you should be able to play the game with it. Yeah. Um, and even though like books have like uh, creeped in size 
since the olden days when I started. Um, because back in the day, man, you could get away with an 88-page book and you could play the hell out of that game like uh, uh, the original like Gamma Run game. That thing was so slim. Uh, but, you know, you could get a lot of mileage out of it. And, you know, that's what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to give everyone everything they could want in a game book because that's the way I like game books to be. I like, you know, I love buying, like, you know, the supplements, but... If I only, you know, could bring one in a backpack, you know, that game should be complete enough for us to actually, you know, play for damn near ever. Mm -hmm. You know, the other stuff to me is just gravy. Um, but, you know, the core book should be the core. You shouldn't need anything else. And that's what uh, I'm trying to do. So, yeah, that one is probably going to be closer to 350 pages. The um, Pantheon book will probably be a little bit bigger because, funny enough, I was working on that today. And I looked at the document, and that thing is, I think, like it's over 100,000 words. No, it's 80,000 words right now, mm -hmm. which is pretty dang big. So I'm not sure if that's going to fit in 128 pages. And uh, beyond that, there's a book, uh, the uh, Epoch book, which is the different time periods in which you can play God's and Agenda so that mm -hmm. you're not necessarily tied to the default setting, which is the mid uh 21st century or actually the beginning of the 21st century not the mid mm -hmm. like the mid 2000s i should say um but you could play it in you know different eras of time and there are different agendas you know concerning those eras so you know age of discovery so-called discovery uh you could play in that age you could play in the age of heroes um so yes if you wanted to play uh god's an agenda in a bygone era like you know ancient egypt or you know west africa or you know the uh you know, the American Midwest, you could actually play it in that because there's so many myths. There's so much material to be used that, you know, why not, man? Why not, mm -hmm. like, uh, use what we got here? So, um, one could probably, yeah, they're going to be... One could probably mm -hmm. use Godsend Agenda to do a um, a game that leans a bit into Tiansha. Okay. I'm not sure what that is. But it sounds delicious. <laughs> um, are you familiar with Wusha? Mm-hmm. Um, Wuxia means martial hero. Tiansha means immortal hero. Um, mm. It's weird that there's so many uh, people named Marshall in uh, China, but whatever. Go on. Ah. <laughs> um, it tends it's it's uh, it's it tends to involve it tends to be, be where a lot of the bigger myth mythos spanning or or even universe spanning um sto stories ten stories tend to be told and obviously a guy like Deathblade can give can give a much better um summary than I can but um the sto one of the one of one of the four one of the four pillars um journey to the west is technically speaking more of a Tiancha story than a Wuxia story right okay so yeah you could mm -hmm. you could um you know is uh as long as you know, I guess you're not, uh, actually you could, cause I think I did write up Wukong for something around here, <laughs> Just, uh, for one of the things, but yeah, you absolutely could. Mm -hmm. But yeah, the different time periods to me, that's a, a good selling point. Um, one thing that I get excited about, cause I do like running genre games, not set, uh, particularly in that particular genre. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, or the the standardized genre of it. Mm -hmm. So if you were going to do, uh, you know, a superhero game, you know, why not do it in, uh, you know, ancient China or, you know, in, you know, some place in like Tanzania, you know, that never gets, uh, 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 you know, shown. And in God's an Agenda, I think that's where, actually, no, we didn't put the space elevator. The space elevator's in West Africa. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, we did a ton of stuff like uh, the background in that thing. It's just, it's silly, it's mm -hmm. sick, yo. Mm -hmm. uh, but, but yeah, no, the uh, the game book is going to be about three hundred and fifty pages, I think, which I need to announce on the Kickstarter. Um, because yeah, I've got a ton of content, and there's uh, and what I'm also doing is just folding in all the existing Gods and Agenda material that was for Second Edition that we did. Mm -hmm. Um. 
you know, going back, looking at that stuff and then going back into it. But there's so much of it that I need to look at and vet through like, you know, different editors and, uh, you know, different consultants and stuff like that mm-hmm. to make sure it's right and not, uh, particularly offensive mm-hmm. and stuff because, uh, it's one thing I don't want to do is be that guy, yeah. but, but no, that is God's an agenda. Mm-hmm. It is, uh, Dang, they're done. Yeah, just... and um, I do want I do want to offer my congr- my congrats on ma- on managing to get over get over the, the um initial goal. Since it's correct. Right. Um, what are you shooting for as far as a release window? Uh, well, we have it set for August, um, of this year. Well, that's gonna be um, a heck of a birthday present for me. <laughs> well, see, there you go. Uh, happy birthday. No, like when I do Kickstarters, I like to have it done. Or at least mostly done mm-hmm. um, before we, you know, we announce it. Just because I don't like, you know, and some people do it and they do it well. Some people are masters of the Kickstarter, and I wish I had like some of their mojo. Mm-hmm. However, I would like to kind of like I, I kind of like people. I'd like to treat people kind of the way I want to be treated. So there's no flim flam. It's like, hey, you guys want a role playing game? And they're like, yeah. And I'm like, you want a, a role playing game now? And they're like, yeah. And I'm like, well, if you give me some money, I'll give you a role playing game, you know, that I've written. Here's mm-hmm. proof of concept. You know, here's a sample of the book, mm-hmm. uh, as opposed to coming at someone and going, hey, would you guys like a role playing game? And they're like, yeah. And it's like, would you like one written about, you know, whatever the genre is, you know, science fiction game? And they're like, yeah. And it's like, well, if you give me some money in four years, I'll give you uh, the game. And they're like, yeah, okay. Uh, and no, I like to actually have it done. So usually before I get going, it's, it's in the can someplace, or at least so much so that, you know, I can get it out in a reasonable time. Um, also, I don't like to do a lot of stretch goals. Like, Mm -hmm. you know, you know, it's like, here, you're paying for this book or you're helping me fund this book, not the book, the weird dice bag and the weird dice and some stickers and a button you know, and a, a, you know, a little boomerang Frisbee, um, you know, and, you know, like just a lot of weird stuff that it's neat to have because sometimes when I back a Kickstarter, I get some of that stuff, but most of it's useless, man. Like there's some like stuff that I've gotten that it's neat, but I really just backed it for the game. And Mm -hmm. I kind of assume and probably incorrectly that that's the way other people think. And I should probably think more mercenary and mm-hmm. see how much money I can juice people for. But you no, know, it's like if you back one of my things, this is what I'm promising you, and this is what I will give you, mm-hmm. and I will give it to you in a reasonable amount of time. <laughs> and uh, so, yes, hopefully by August, uh, Kickstarter's still going right now, going to the 28th. I figured I'd do it in Black History Month, and uh, you know, one because uh, I love Black History Month. And two, it's the shortest month, which means I don't have to do a 30-day Kickstarter. Mm -hmm. I get two days off. (laughs) Boom. Because I'm lazy. Uh, Well, I think I um, – isn't there there that old – isn't there that old proverb about if you have a complicated – if you need a complicated job, um, give it to the – give it to the laziest guy because he'll find the simplest way to get it done? Oh, (laughs) most most definitely, man. I mean – and trust me, like I've been, dig- I'm diagnosed with lazy. I'm, uh, I'm suffering from it right now. <laughs> and so, yeah, everything I do, I do to have the least amount of impact on my life. Like I cannot, I can't be bothered. I'm that guy. I'm, uh, you know, so when I do something, I want to make it as easy as possible. I also want to make it as easy as possible for the people who have honestly been very generous with like their money and their trust because mm-hmm. to do a Kickstarter, man. It, it's always kind of rewarding to know that someone would trust me enough to give me a hundred dollars for a sample PDF that I've put up. You know what I mean? It's like, it's not really a hardback book yet. It's not, you know, it doesn't have all the art, but someone believes in it enough to actually trust me with whatever money they're giving to me, man. And I mean, you know, these books aren't cheap and mm-hmm. you know, it's, it's actually kind of gratifying to know that people will trust me. And since they do, I kind of feel like I can't let you down because 
especially with smaller, like independent publishers, most of us, the person that you talk to about the role playing game is the person who created it. Mm-hmm. You know, it's, it's, it, and so really, I am selling you my word is what I'm selling you. And, you know, if you trust me enough, I will do my best not to uh, let you down. Not to say I won't, because something might come up and I'll be like, listen, I can't do it, guys, because I got in an accident. My hand got chopped off. So, you know, this game is going to be four years late. But, you know, no, I'd rather treat you with as much respect as you've treated me. And, you know, to play it forward, if I can, you know, into the next Kickstarter, you know, that might not necessarily be mine. But, you know, if I see one that I feel has merit, you know, I'll back it. Or sometimes I'll go behind the scenes and see if I can help them with it just because I've seen some Kickstarters that had so much potential, but you could tell like the person didn't have the skills to present it properly or didn't have, you know, a particular set of skills that might make it a little bit better. And yeah, like there's there's a few games that are out there that uh, I went and designed their logo for them because the logo they had on there was just painful. And it's like, listen, just use this. And they're like, oh, I can't pay you for it. I'm like, you can pay me. Just give me a copy of that book and we'll call it even, you know, um, mm-hmm. which, you know, people are always surprised with like Tenra, you know, the some of the work I did on that one. But I didn't do it because it sucked. I did it because, you know, Andy asked me. So I was there on that one. But, <laughs> yeah, there's games that have actually kind of been competitors of my games and, you know, People don't realize that even though like our games are kind of the same, they would think, oh, they're competing against each other. It's like, nah, you know, we're cool with each other. We're actually friends. It's like they've actually helped me, mm-hmm. you know. Uh, but no, the uh, I'm always uh, gratified with these Kickstarters that people are willing to trust me enough to go on this adventure with me and mm-hmm. help make uh, books. Because to me, I guess, you know, I could be mercenary and say it's all for the money, but no way, man, because... Really, I project that I will be making tens of dollars on this Kickstarter. But the cool part is, is that I will have an artifact that I could play with my friends. Mm-hmm. So that's really my ulterior motive is to be a, a gamer mm-hmm. and to play games. Oh, yeah. But with with all that in mind, I do want to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come back up to the temple and enjoy the insanity that happens around here. It's it's nice in this temple. I mean, you know, I'm I have to say there's a lot of incense burning in here, and you know, it's uh. But other than that, it's it's uh, it's nice, and I like you know when I went into the uh the men's room of the temple, and you know you had that little patchouli oil dispenser mm-hmm. that was nice, and uh, no, it's nice, and I and I enjoy this like uh, serapi that you gave me to wear because mm-hmm. <laughs> uh it's nice and comfortable in here, yeah. man. The bean bags, this uh. You know, this tiled floor with uh, this cool design down here. This is awesome. I love this place. <laughs> yeah. Oh. And, so, and yeah. Anytime, oh, go on. anytime you see fit to return, the door is always open. As I often say oh. around here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. That's right. That's right. And maybe I'll do some of that tonight. <laughs> and by drinking, I mean uh, go take uh, some mescaline <laughs> and lay down. Yeah. But anyway... And when, of, I'm laying, when I'm laying with my uh, knees up to my chest. <laughs> and, of, and, of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here on the open bar of the Internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra. I am your gaming monk. Stay fucking frosty, everybody. <laughs>